afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar on rebuilding local retail, where we will be discussing the implications for operations, design, and technology due to the unprecedented disruptions from the global pandemic. My name is Roderick Mary Bojic. I'm the director for the Center for Real Estate Entrepreneurship, and I'm joined today by our co-host, Gautam Vadakapat, director of the new Retail Innovation Center, both at the School of Business at George Mason University. For those of you that don't know the Real Estate Center, we are the university's platform for real estate education um, and its forum for important real estate topics. Uh, we'd like to thank the members of our center's advisory board. These are some of the leading real estate organiza organizations in the Metro DC area, whose guidance and financial support allowed George Mason to deliver educational programs like the one that we have today. And for those who don't know the Retail Innovation Center, which should be most of you, because this is a brand new center that we are actually in the pre-launch phase. This is a center that is aimed at trying to provide a platform for small and medium-sized retailers and to bring together the whole retail ecology within the George Mason domain uh, to help these retailers manage the transition that disruptions such as COVID or technology driven disruptions are causing for the sector. The retail center works on four tenants of technology, analytics, logistics, and people being core to the success of the future of retail, all of which should work synergistically to provide a superior customer experience. If any of you are interested in joining the retail center, please do reach out to me later and I'll have my contact information at the end of this webinar. All right, thanks, Gotham. So we'll proceed to our discussion panel this afternoon. So this is a time of great disruption to retail and our retail places. Foot traffic to shopping centers have plunged. Groceries and pharmacies are doing well, but restaurants, personal services, and merchandisers have suffered greatly. Uh, consumers are increasingly turning to e-commerce, delivery, and takeout, and some retail brands uh, are closing for good and others have started to reopen with contactless technology and different store layouts. Some stores have morphed into micro fulfillment centers. What do all these disruptions mean for the future of retail? What roles will new design and technology play going forward in the in-store experience and the entire reopening process? Uh, I'd like to thank our panel today for sharing their time and expertise on these and many other topics. I'd like to introduce them. Uh, joining us today is Paul Weinschenk, president of retail for Peterson Companies. He oversees all aspects of Peterson's 6 million square foot retail portfolio, including construction, development, asset management, and leasing for centers such as National Harbor, Fairfax Corner, Fair Lakes, Rio, and downtown Silver Spring. Welcome, Paul. Next is Ricardo Belmar. He's the Senior Lead Director for Global Enterprise Marketing and Retail Transformation at InfoVista. He helps organizations create business value from technology investments. Ricardo is a top social media industry influencer um, and is frequently interviewed by retail publications and podcasts. Uh, welcome, Ricardo. Um, Mike Smith is the Director of Real Estate of Street Sense bringing nearly 25 years of industry experience in site analysis, strategy, design, and leasing. Projects include the wharf, the collection at Chevy Chase, and the redevelopment of the historic Walter Reed campus. Welcome, Mike. Uh, and finally, Mark Hastings' retail background includes a portfolio of leadership roles with over 20 years at Target and three years at Starbucks. He then moved on as COO for Come and Go, a major chain of convenience stores in the Midwest, and most recently as COO of My Eye Doctor, where he led these retail businesses through scale and growth. So welcome everybody. 
And I'd like to remind our audience that throughout the discussion, if you have any questions for our panel, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And I'd like to turn over the uh, panel to Gautam, who will act as our moderator this afternoon. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, thank you, panelists, once again, for being here with us and taking time. So we have two big themes that we want to discuss today. Now that we are in phase three of the reopening, many states are showing a resurgence in COVID. And reports, on the other hand, seem to indicate that, you know, retail sales are up. I think the numbers were 17% retail sales growth, which is one data point, but people seem to make a lot of things out of it. And there's a lot of ambiguity about how retail reopening is actually going on. The, the headings kind of indicate that, right? You have two headings that kind of conflict each other, where one says U.S. consumers feel safer about in-store shopping, and then one that says kind of the opposite, says consumers more open to spending but less comfortable entering stores. So there seems to be a lot of uncertainty about how the reopening is going, so the first question to each one of you is, let's kind of unveil the layers and take a look and get your perspective on how reopening is really going uh, from each of your individual unique vantage points and what you think is the recovery shape going to look like. Is it really the V-shape that a lot of people are talking about? Is it the L shape, the U shape? Who knows what, what the next shape is? I personally don't think it's a V-shape, but I would love to hear your opinion about it. So maybe we can start with Paul and then work our way around, Marcus, Michael, and then Ricardo. Sure, well, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with everybody this afternoon. And uh, we've been underway here for a while in terms of our planning and thinking about what reopening looks like and, and have done a lot of work at our projects uh, to create as uh, welcoming and, and, and uh, enjoyable an environment as we possibly can, uh, both to uh, assist our, our tenants uh, in being successful as they reopen and in supporting our, um, our, our customers. Uh, we've done a lot of work through social media to survey consumers. Uh, we've got uh, about 5,000 responses through that process that have been really helpful to us. And so what that's led us to do is to really emphasize uh, creating opportunities for uh, food and beverage tenants to expand out beyond the confines of their four walls. Uh, if they had outdoor dining to expand it, if they weren't taking advantage of outdoor dining in the past to, to be using it now going forward. Uh, we have of course done a lot of work on site in terms of social distancing messaging uh, creating uh, information that's readily available, visible to people, just reminding them uh, to practice certain behaviors as they're uh, at visiting one of our one of our locations. And um, we've done things to um, create more space for the public to walk and to spend time casually outside of a restaurant or outside of a uh, outside of a store. Um, and uh, additional seating, blocking off streets, eliminating parking and uh, creating moments, uh, if you will, uh, at the properties that are kind of fun and kind of engaging. Uh, we've got at our Rio property, we've got a great outdoor space with a wonderful turf area and stage, and we've kind of marked off these uh, rings of six feet to kind of remind us to keep our, our distance, but that is kind of visually interesting. And we've done things at other properties uh, that people can in, interact with and engage with um, that are painted onto sidewalks or painted onto uh, streets that uh, it might be a hopscotch moment or a big tic-tac-toe moment, whatever it might be, just to give people the sense of it's comfortable, I'm happy being here, and uh, you know anything that we can then do with our tenants to partner, we're doing as well. So uh, tenants are looking to remove uh, FF and E out of uh, their existing locations. That might be a restaurant, it might be a uh, soft goods retailer, uh, where we have uh, available space, vacant space. We're saying, you know what, let's, let's, let's make it easy. Let's take that material and store it in, in, a, in a location on site and uh, it'll be ready for you when you need it. But in the meantime, it's out of your way and helps you uh, enforce the uh, sort of social distancing requirements. So it's really kind of hitting it from all sorts of 
perspectives on site and then through um, social media and online, really doing a lot of work on the marketing side uh, to message what's happening at the properties and uh, what's going on with tenants so that the uh, consumer has good up-to-date information about what they can expect when they arrive at one of our properties. Uh, Paul, that was a great update, and uh, I appreciate you going first. It's always uh, fun to hear what uh, what real estate is thinking, and um, so it's an interesting perspective. Um, I, I would say something I want to echo. Every retailer, restauranteur, they're doing everything they possibly can to try to reduce anxiety, not only amongst the uh, consumer, but also amongst their employee base. And I think that that's something that uh, you don't want to be dismissive about. Uh, but I also want to go back to something that Gotham had talked about. <clears throat> uh, in May, you saw retail sales uh, allegedly up 17.7%. And the further I dug into this, it's really, it was up over April, 17.7%. If you subtract automobile sales and fuel, retail sales year over year were only up 1.7%. But again, um, however you want to look at it, the media was pretty excited to see some nice uptick in, uh, in retail sales. Uh, if you add automobile sales uh, and fuel, it was down 6.1 year over year. So I just say, be a little bit skeptical of all the uh, reports that you see. I see Gotham kind of smiling back there, but you, but you need to be a little bit skeptical and dig into some of the reports, especially if you're a retailer yourself and you're not seeing those same um, types, of types of improvements. Um, Necessity is the mother of invention. We've heard this for many, many years. And, you know, I will tell you, we'll get into the technology conversation in a little bit. But many of us have uh, maybe postponed using uh, touchless uh, payments, you know, Apple Pay or whatever it might be, Google Pay. Um, but many of us are kind of morphing that direction. And I think a lot of retailers and restauranteurs um, are, are making um, strides in that direction. Uh, I give, you know, big kudos to the Starbucks uh, organization that years ago, they, they saw this as a, a nice trend um, to try to uh, speed up the, the transaction. They had no idea, obviously, that a pandemic was going to be coming. But, um, but I think it's important to understand that retailers that have um, sort of, you know, with pace created uh, an environment where it was uh, more simple to shop. Um, a safer environment. You think about paths of travels, six foot markings, uh, scheduling appropriately. Um, uh, even at Target, you know, they sort of um, closed off the Starbucks and their food avenue and said all of our associates are going to work on replenishing the shelves because uh, you had sort of uh, the, the uh, purging of buying, you know, toilet paper and hand sanitizer and the whatnots. <clears throat> I think it's very important and you see this that uh, organizations or retailers are doing visible cleaning. Um, and uh, they've also curtailed their hours of operation so that they can get the, um, get the store put back in good shape um, and do some additional cleaning overnight um, so that they're uh, reducing any kind of anxiety. I think the final point I want to talk about is there really was a bifurcation in society. So there's those who were very, very concerned didn't want to leave their house, um, wearing a mask uh, in the car by themselves. You might see them on the road. And then you have the other side of society that, um, you know, really doesn't believe this is a real thing. And they're uh, kind of willing to put themselves and their friends and their family at jeopardy. Um, and I think retailers are trying to placate to both, to be honest. I think they're trying to provide a safe environment. Um, and in some cases, uh, they're, they're kind of putting their frontline employees uh, in a situation where they have to have conversations with customers um, to say, hey, you can't come in and shop. And my preference would be that uh, organizations um, have masks on the ready and, um, and as opposed to you know, asking customers to leave, um, you, know, uh, you know, maybe provide them with some PPE and I'll allow them to, uh, to do their shopping if it was a necessity type of trip. Uh, well said, Marcus. Um, so uh, the way we look at it is we're sort of in this three phase situation here. You know, right now everyone is, um, is scrambling to deal with um, you know, preventing uh, transmission and, and maintaining health. Um, at some point as whether it's a, a vaccine or treatment uh, or even an effective contact tracing system, we'll get into sort of this period where it's a bit of a mental hangover where you've got some very real concerns, but also just some mental uh, uh, leftovers, residuals from, um, 
from when times were, were super tough. And then I think we genuinely will see some permanent disruptions. It's difficult to, um, to, to predict these things, but there's some things that we're already starting to see that, you know, I have reason to believe, we have reason to believe that there's no reason why they won't stick around. Um, but I think a lot of us would agree that this whole situation has accelerated a lot of what was already happening. You know, we've spent the last 50, 60 years overbuilding retail, um, not keeping up with demand. Um, and that's been due to shareholder pressure on national retailers to expand, um, on municipalities pressuring developers to line every street of their projects with retail. And we're, we've been paying the price for the last 10, 20, really paying it now. We'll continue to see that. Um, all at a time, especially in the last 10 years, when the number of prospects out there that you actually have to fill the space and not just fill it, but over their tenancies to fulfill their, their tenancy obligation, that pool of prospects has been decreasing for the last 10 plus years. Um, so right now, we have a, a, different, a, you know, a multitude of client bases. Uh, with our bids, um, we're encouraging them to communicate more, uh, not just with the tenants in the neighborhood, but also with the community to, to, to convey what's going on out there, similar to what Paul was saying about using this wonderful weather that we have at this time of year to get people out and, and sort of force these connections uh, outside of their houses um, and shut down streets. Uh, you know, initially, it was scrambling to get the outdoor seating, and now you're starting to see groups do it better. Um, initially, it was, you know, it was a little bit lackluster, and now you're starting to see it done better and better. Um, our landlord clients, you know, for the most part, they're, they're scrambling. They're saving their deals. It's easier to hold on to a tenant, especially in, in this uh, day and age, than it is to let them go and then try to find another one. Our tenant and our hotel clients, they're trying to maximize the experience. And today, the experience is just as much about health and safety as it is about making things fun. Um, but everyone's trying to ride this thing out. Um, the Nationals do over expansion and taking on excessive debt. They've been spending the last few months negotiating, uh, renegotiating with, with landlords. And for a few months, there was this harmony uh, happening between the two, but landlords are starting to play hardball. At the end of the day, we live in this ecosystem where you have investors, you have landlords, you have the tenants, and you have property managers. And without you know, all of us working together, the system starts to break down. Uh, locally speaking, if you're a local merchant, it depends on where you are. You know, we're all seeing what's happening in the South um, for markets that are uh, you know, um, that have been hit uh, uh, harder, there's been a trepidation. Um, even though we're opening our doors, you know, within a, a few per a week period of time as each other, um, we see a lot of delivery, right? And and for a consumer, that makes a lot of sense. I'd rather eat at home the same product than uh, than than uh, take my life in my own hands and go out. But what isn't being report is being reported, but not to a great extent, is that profit margins just plummet when uh, retailers lean on, oh, firstly, food and beverage operators when they lean on delivery services, caviar, Uber, etc. Um, they also don't consumers don't purchase as much as they do when they walk through the door. Um, I credit municipalities for easing up on legislation for for uh, for liquor licenses and allowing restaurants to to do um, to go alcohol, which carries a lot of margins and helps at least sort of take on a small fraction of the uh, of the burden, but they're just trying to stay alive. And if this thing continues, you know, we've been really, really lucky that this all happened during a warmer period of the year. If we didn't, if this were happening in the cold of the winter, we wouldn't have the outdoor seating to take advantage of. We wouldn't have the outdoor sales that we're getting today as the doors start to open. So, you know, it makes me a little bit nervous about what things are going to look like in November, December in, in colder climates and what that means for tenants who have just trying to keep the lights on. Uh, if PPP goes away and if the outdoor opportunity goes away, I think we're gonna see a bigger shoe drop. Yeah, I think those are all great comments, Mike and Marcus and Paul. And I think I wanna add a few things more from a, a pure technology point of view. And I'm gonna kind of start with one thing that was said, and I think everyone's been hinting at, right? That a lot of the, the trends and things, especially around technology and retail that we see are just being accelerated. They're not necessarily new. They're not necessarily things that had been ignored, but they were in many cases, things that were perceived as a nice to have and not quite yet necessary because there, there wasn't perhaps a consumer demand. Where now the consumer demand has dramatically changed. Um, now on, on the positive side of thing, I do want to add a few positive things because I think it's easy in any of these kind of discussions to focus on the negatives. And um, I, I think it was you, Marcus or Michael, one of you mentioned how that the media perception is not quite 
as realistic as I think people in the retail industry, you know, see it day to day. There, there tends to be this focus on all the negative things of which brands are, are going to die, which ones are closing. Um, and while, yeah, there's going to be some of that to happen, but in reality, a lot of those things are going to happen anyway. Uh, it's just that they're all converging now. But on the positive side, uh, if the one thing for me, the main numbers uh, tell us is that there was in fact some degree of pent up demand, not as much as many people may have wanted to see. Uh, I think maybe it was a bit misplaced. I and mean, one, one retailer I talked to was fond of uh, mentioning that, you know, when people talk about pent up demand, there's sort of the media has this expectation that because people couldn't rush out to buy things for three months, they're suddenly going to buy five times as much as they would. Uh, and that seems a bit silly when, when you think about it. I don't think most retailers viewed that. Certainly, if you think of service oriented places like a, a hair salon, right, everybody only needed one haircut. You didn't need five haircuts when you can suddenly go back. You just needed the one. Uh, so, but we were all going to rush out and do it at the same time. So I think that's, if anything, what the main numbers are going to tell us is, uh, one, yes, there was some pent-up demand, not as much as people may have liked. Uh, but then the reason you see 17%, Mark, as you outlined it perfectly, why that looks like a big number when in reality it's not really that big a number. And I think the one point I would add is when you had such a huge drop in April, it's a lot easier to get an inc a rate increase when you're working off of a smaller number than you're used to. So these things are kind of a little uh, easy to manipulate from a, from a data perspective. Uh, but I do think what we are seeing is that uh, this is not the death of SOARS, which a lot of the media reports may want to kind of rush to. Uh, you know, there, there's always been this lingering view of will online e-commerce gobble up brick and mortar and end uh, the store relationship with consumers. And I think if, if that was ever going to happen, this was the time that we were going to see it. And what are the examples that we saw? I mean, if I take a best case, uh, say a store like Best Buy, uh, which did not, for the most part, have stores open, but they did do creative things like enable a new curbside pickup service, store visits by appointment. Uh, they, they certainly pushed heavily the ability to buy online uh, and either have it shipped or, or pick up in store. So for those kinds of items, which we, we all tend to think of as being more natural and instinctive to buy online, as we're talking about, electronics types of devices, even for Best Buy, their sales did not shift 100%. They did not maintain all of their sales online when their stores were, were closed. Uh, and if that was ever going to happen, you know, this, this would have been the moment. So I think one point we can make is that this sort of dispels the thought that online was going to take over uh, one day in the future, 100% of retail. It's not. It's going to be uh, one channel is going to have a lot of influence. I think we have definitely seen the level of influence that digital commerce can have for retailers out of this. And, and that leads to you know, some implications on technology. Uh, you know, I think it, we've already mentioned how uh, contactless payments, for example, were, were probably a slow, to, nice to have kind of thing for a lot of retailers where they knew this was coming, they were going to enable it, but there wasn't anything driving them to rush out, upgrade POS systems and really turn on the contactless. Now that's something that consumers are in, in many ways looking for. I've seen plenty of studies where people have a preference now. Uh, and I think this is a technology area where as a consumer, once you experience it, you come to realize that, you know, this is actually more convenient than what I used to do. I'm going to seek it out now as a consumer and retailers are going to respond to that. Now, so I think that's one change, for example, that we, we've seen a, a dramatic shift. I think that's a shift we'll, we'll see is going to stick around. Uh, there's been a lot of talk in other areas like delivery services, uh, particularly around grocery, where that was a very sig small percentage previously. I think we've all seen the reports of how many hundreds of thousands of people, Instacart and others like them, are rushing out to hire. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, and we've, see we've seen great examples of this, even Kroger when they released their quarterly numbers and Target, while they're all increasing that top line revenue, it's coming at a high cost. Uh, the, the, the ability to have people handpick merchandise in the store as if they were the customer in the store and then pack that for a curbside pickup or for an, uh, a complete last mile delivery is too high a cost for most retailers to maintain profitability with that. Uh, now, consumers, on the other hand, of course, are finding this to be extremely convenient uh, to do and are likely to want more of that. Uh, but there's going to have, there's going to be a balance somewhere. I, I think many people uh, I mean, I can speak from experience from talking to my neighbors and everyone in my neighborhood where uh, just coincidentally happened to be these delivery services just reached my community in the, in the month before all of this crisis started. We didn't have any of these services before. Uh, and if you look at uh, Facebook groups and, and social media regionally here, everyone just, you know, en masse drove to using these services. Um, 
but I'm also hearing from people that, you know, there, there, there are downsides, right? When you can't pick these things yourself, you're willing to accept some tolerance when the world is in crisis, but when it's not, are you willing to accept as much of that? I think we'll see a leveling off of that over time. But where the technology will come in is we're going to see the solution providers for this really finding more efficient ways to do this. Um, you know, on the delivery side, we, we, particularly again in grocery and essential retailers, there's much more interest now in micro fulfillment services. The concept of having a, uh, for lack of a better term, would be a dark store where we might repurpose a, a full store or a portion of, of store square footage to really be a behind the scenes fulfillment space where customers don't have access, but you can organize products in a way that makes more sense for automated fulfillment than it does for a customer to wander the aisles uh, and choosing product. And that will help lower costs for that. So I do believe we'll see a movement for that uh, over time with retail enabling more and more of those things. And that's gonna adjust the relationship between retailers uh, and landlords and how the, the space is used, what kind of space retailers want and what technology they're gonna put into that space and where that technology will come from. We'll see some variation there. Uh, I'm also hearing from a number of people exploration into technology that again, they wouldn't have expected to want to look at for a few more years. Uh, for example, leveraging augmented reality for virtual try-on experiences. I think apparel retailers are really having a struggle right now where they have to decide, do I open the fitting rooms? Do I allow people to try on merchandise? And if I do, what do I do with that merchandise now that someone has tried it on and not purchased it? I can't just put it back on display. I need to hold it for a while. I need to make sure that the next customer that comes along feels that the, this merchandise is safe uh, to handle. Uh, or do I simply close fitting rooms and I just don't, I do, I postpone, essentially defer a return process that is always a nightmare for many retailers in the apparel segment to a future date and, and hope I can deal with it then. Um, so the, this idea of a virtual trying experience, there were examples of this before in other segments. Sephora is one that I think always comes to mind. They have a good virtual try and experience in their stores that they're relying on right now quite heavily. Apparel brands are more interested in this now. Uh, it comes at a cost, right? You know, there have been virtual fitting room type of experiences before. Many of us have seen these at trade shows like NRF before, and there's always interest, but again, they have a high price tag. Uh, so there, there hasn't been a rush to implement. Those things are being reevaluated now and that maybe there needs to be more of this uh, implemented in order to make people uh, enticed enough to come back to that shopping experience. Uh, where in the past technology was becoming much more front and center in that in-store experience, particularly around touch screens and devices that customers would need to interact with. There's not as much interest in, in that at the moment. Uh, I've heard a number of folks tell me that, you know, that as an industry, we've spent the last decade or so trying to touch enable the store and really focus on technology and devices. And now all of a sudden consumers want the opposite. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the opposite. And that's what uh, retailers are starting to find that if I had a touchscreen interface, maybe I want to find solution providers that can give me a gesture based interface where the consumer doesn't have to touch the screen, but there's a sensor that monitors, you know, do they swipe, do a swipe gesture in front of the screen to create the same effect. That's a much more safe environment from the consumer's point of view. So I think we will see more technologies of that sort uh, having a presence now in these areas versus the, the let's call it the traditional uh, touchscreen experience. Uh, so we, we've already mentioned things around sanitizing the store. Uh, one of the things that that's really impacted uh, are from a store operations point of view is how the staff handles these new processes and new procedures that previously, it's not that they weren't being done, but they were handled in a very different manner and less frequently. So it's much more disruptive now for the staff to have to follow all of these processes. And that implies new training that needs to be done. Uh, and training has always been a challenge for retail, primarily because of the high turnover rates in store staff. Uh, so now I, I've seen many new solutions coming to prominence with what I'll call a more of a micro training experience where we're just pushing small new procedures and, and changes to workflow to get staff used to those processes rather than trying to say, here's an entire new procedural book that our, our staff needs to learn and, and follow. By properly cutting those down into, into smaller chunks, we can get more retention uh, from associates. And technology is helping to do this with new digital workflow tools. Uh, there had been a trend to digitally enable associates with devices. Now those devices may not necessarily be for a customer facing experience as much as it would be for an operational experience for the associate to 
be able to more easily do their job and comply with all of these new procedures that the stores need. So a definite shift in how we're applying technology, I, I would say a bigger shift towards more behind the scenes applications than the customer facing ones. But that's not to say that the customer facing ones will go away. I think they'll just be adaptive. So maybe we can pick that up a little bit more. And, uh, but I see that we have five, I had a few questions, but I think we have five questions. So maybe Eric, do you want to try and jump? Yeah, in? Um, there, there are two that sort of I, I'll sort of summarize as they're related to some of the comments. So one question has to do with vaccine. Um, if in fact there is a vaccine that's workable at some point, does that change all of the things that we're discussing right now? I mean, I'll comment just from, for example, from the technology point of view. I mean, some of these things you can argue, sure, that, that may change. If there is a vaccine and it's successfully distributed and we fast forward to a time when uh, we consider ourselves fully vaccinated, will people have as much of a concern over you know, touch interfaces? I, I would expect most likely those concerns will, will diminish. There won't be as significant. Um, however, I do think because as, as we've seen, you know, we've talked about this bifurcation of, of the general population, one extreme view versus another. I think we're still going to see there will be an extreme view that says, great, we vaccinated for this one, but what if there's another one? Do I want to retrain myself and change those habits yet again? Uh, I, I've seen just, you know, for just as many discussions that happen in that perspective, uh, people will, will bring back that, you know, there was the 1918 flu pandemic and did society completely change over a after they got through that? And in the end, you look back at historical records and say, well, you know what? No, it really didn't. It was temporary. So why wouldn't this be temporary? I, I think one of the main differences I would throw out is that we didn't have the technology in place then. We weren't talking about things like touchscreens or, or devices or how we handle uh, technology. Uh, and technology now has a different place in, in our lives and in, in culture. So I don't think we can make that comparison. But I do think that there will be less of a cause for concern, but there will still be groups of people who will have that concern. And unfortunately for retailers, right, you, you don't want to isolate any of those demographics and, and risk losing them as a customer. You, you've got to find the balance uh, to be able to accommodate them. Yeah. I think uh, the, the longer these things, the longer this goes on, um, the longer it will take back or take to get to get back to a, a place where these temporary disruptions uh, go away. Um, you know, guards between tables at a restaurant, for example. Um, if this had happened for a, a blip for a week, um, we probably would have had a, you know, fewer people in our working population widely embrace things like Zoom, not to suggest that everyone loves Zoom or, or video conferencing. But the longer it goes on, the longer, you, you know, the more of these uh, disruptions you'll see, and I think the, the longer they'll, they'll um, the, the temporary um, uh, disruptions will, will linger. Paul, Marcus, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I'll, I'll add really quick. I think, um, you know, if there is a vaccine, uh, which uh, we can only hope for, to be honest with you, um, I do think that it will uh, give a level of confidence to the general population that they can go back out. Uh, I think Ricardo brings up a very interesting perspective too. You know, well, what if something different happens, um, you know, coming out of a lab somewhere, uh, you know, you just never know. But, you know, the fortunate thing about our population is we have very short-term memories. And so <laughs> we forget these things pretty quickly and we'll go back to some old habits. Um, I'm already hearing, you know, even from, you um, uh, some of the analysts that work with grocery stores, the grocery store channels are not expecting, you know, if, if things kind of clean up, they're not expecting that channel to continue to have the, uh, the uh, incredible business that it's had. They kind of expect the population to go back to restaurants and things like that. So um, I think some of these things are a little bit more short lived, but, but if we have a vaccine, then I think, uh, you know, probably pushes that a little bit further. I, I would say too, maybe just to, to wrap up, uh, I think Ricardo is exactly right. Uh, all these things of technology organizations were working for, they just didn't put the capital behind it. They didn't have enough IT developers behind it. Um, you know, they maybe have one or two developers kind of working on it, um, it, you know, just to sort of sort of save face and whatnot. But uh, this, this really did push the accelerator for those things. And you see that in the marketplace because a lot of times it's not working, it's not user-friendly, uh, and they're now trying to clean that up. All right. Um, I guess, Gotham, if there are no, uh, we probably in there's no time, you should probably proceed to the, the second question. 
Yeah, I'm mute. I'll unmute yourself, Carlton. It will. It would help to unmute myself and speak instead of speaking to an empty <laughs> <laughs> audience. Well, I was just going to say, uh, in the interest of time, we should probably think about moving forward and to take out your crystal ball, if you will, and to see. And Marcus kind of set this up very nicely, right? He said, like, hey, we all have a very short-term memory. Now, are any of these changes, this touchless thing or curbside pickup, are these going to be permanent or are we, is this just a temporary phase? What do you think? Like, do you think there are some aspects of the change that we are already envisioning becoming permanent? Or are, and are there other things that are just going to go away? I also want to use this context to ask another question, which I thought was interesting in the comments was that Michael, I believe said like, uh, we might be over retailed. Uh, and I want to get the audiences, the panels take on this. Are we, is that the reason why we are seeing an escalation of bankruptcies? We are over debt, they're drawn out. There's way more retail per square footage than maybe expected. Uh, is that the reasons or, and finally, you know, Paul had this nice picture in the background about this mall and you have people walking around. So as I see it, retail is a convening space for people to engage with each other. And I strongly personally believe that physical brick and mortar retail has a place in the economy. So talk a little bit, I know Ricardo stated his perspective on that physical retail is not going to go away. I would love to hear your thoughts as well, uh, the rest of the panel's thought as well on the state of physical retail, is it going to go away? How is it going to transform if it's not going to go away? So with that, the floor is yours. Um, if you can just share, take a few minutes to give us a big picture and then we'll try to answer a few questions. Sure, and I'm happy to kind of lead us off on this one. Uh, you know, the, the, the question you pose is one that is a retail developer and a retail long-term owner that uh, we think a lot about and um, sort of the conclusion uh, I've come to is that we're sort of at the top of the second inning, maybe even still the bottom of the first. Um, so a lot of what the world is going to look like is, is yet to be revealed. And I, I think there's a lot of validity to what Marcus was saying about people having short-term memories. I think that we will um, over some period of time come back to a lot of behaviors that are familiar to us, uh, but some new ones uh, will probably stick with us for a while. Um, there's there's no, no question in my mind that in order to really um, ultimately have a good handle on what things look like, we, we need sort of confidence in three areas. Uh, one is clearly sort of just economic confidence, right? People need to be back at work, they need to be uh, cashing a paycheck, they need to feel like they have the ability to spend money if they're going to be an active participant in the retail world. Uh, the vaccine speaks to the whole health confidence issue and, and people are going to have to have a sense longer term that uh, this is not out there lurking again and that if it is that they're going to be immune to it because they've been vaccinated. Uh, more recently, I would actually add a third uh, kind of topic, um, which is political confidence, and just in terms of how people feel about where we are uh, nationally uh, in our politics and how people engage with one another. I think that will also have an impact in what retail ends up looking like. Um, I've got sort of four kind of quick thoughts on, um, on the future of retail. One is, you know, this question of fulfillment. And I, I, it's really, for me, it's more of a question than an answer. You know, the, the question is sort of people doing more online and retailers thinking about their space uh, as a piece of the fulfillment mechanism and that last mile and having people shop online and then come to the store to do the pickup or shopping online and having the delivery to the home coming out of the store. And what I'm trying to figure out as a, as a property owner, as a landlord is, um, the tenants who have been, you know, let's make up a number, you know, who have been paying $20 a foot to occupy junior anchor space, uh, if they decide that they're going to do a lot of internet fulfillment out of that store, given the economics of, of a $20 rent, is that going to make them any money? 
uh, or are they doing the online fulfillment there as part of a, a loss leader kind of a, a view? Or are they gonna say, you know what, I need to pivot to a different kind of space. And if they do that, what are the implications for landlords in terms of rent? Um, so there's a really kind of interesting question there about what happens longer term. Hold on. We have these nice energy efficient lights here. The problem is after a while, if you're not moving, that the lights go off. So um, you know, that's our, our part of uh, helping the, uh, the, uh, the environment. Um, the, the other sort of related question too is if we're all doing more online shopping, uh, do we get to go into a store and, and still see the same selection of merchandise that we were used to? And if we don't, does that then sort of drive us out of the store and back uh, into online shopping? So is there some sort of a cycle that kind of builds on itself? Now the last two pieces are both physical in nature. Uh, this question of drive-throughs, I've been hearing a lot, a lot lately from the brokerage community and the tenant community about interest in locations where we have drive-through capabilities. Uh, will that stick? Uh, likewise, curbside. Yeah, everybody's doing curbside. Will that practice stay with the retailers uh, and the restaurants? Uh, how will they ultimately want to redesign buildings to make curbside something that's uh, better than what it is now? And what does that look like? Uh, will they want effectively what is a drive-through, but it's not really a drive-through in that you're not placing the order on site, you're placing the order online, but now you just want to be able to pick up from a, a window at the restaurant or at the retailer, and will local jurisdictions view that as a drive-through, even though the ordering isn't being done there? All kind of, uh, all interesting questions. I don't have the answers yet. You know, let's talk about it in a few years. And, and when we do, uh, here's what I'm confident of. We are going to see some things in a few years that we would never have anticipated now, whether it's in the way we develop or in the kinds of retail, retail that is invented. Uh, at the beginning of this conversation, uh, uh, one of the panelists mentioned the necessity being the mother of invention. And I'm absolutely sure there are gonna be some really cool and interesting things that get invented right now that uh, landlords are gonna be super eager to have in their projects in the future. And it will all have come out of COVID and the need that grew up then for some people to think differently about what they are doing. Paul, I think you, uh, you nailed a lot of my points. Um, I would, maybe my headline here, you know, uh, Gotham, you asked, um, you know, what's gonna, what's gonna stick. And my experience in the world of retail, whether you're an employer or a customer, is things that simplify lives or th things that simplify a process over what it used to be will stick. Things that are more complicated, don't work on a regular basis, are going to be disposable, and they're going to go back to the old way because that's what they're comfortable with. Muscle memory is really, really hard to change. Um, the other thing I would say is... In a lot of retailers, BOPUS, you know, um, it, it is and has been an important part of uh, their strategy the last 100, 100 and some odd days. But what it's becoming is a reservation of the hotter items, the harder to find items. And uh, I know a little bit of this because my son actually works on this project for Target. And he tells me, Dad, like what people are doing is reserving the hot items and they go into the store and that social interaction of still shopping around and picking things up and then going out and getting what they, what they uh, bought online and pick up at the store is, is how that's going. So it'll be interesting to see how that uh, morphs or evolves over time. Um, and I think that's what I had to add. I think that's well put. I, I, I don't think bricks and mortar is going anywhere. Um, and But I also think e-commerce will continue to grow. You know, it took, what, 17, 18 years for Amazon to turn a profit on, on deliveries. And it's still a tough go, whether it's Amazon, uh, Gap, or, or the grocers. Um, and uh, that's why bricks and mortar makes a lot of sense, is the omni-channel approach allows me to, if I wanted to, buy a TV from Best Buy and have it delivered in, in – uh, two hours or go pick it up right away. And it gives you that flexibility and it helps you to, uh, to fulfill those, those last mile things that up until recently, depending on what market you're in, um, Amazon has even struggled to do and, and to be as competitive as, as groups who already have real estate. Um, uh, now, I think that that will mean fewer deals out there to be had. I think that you'll see footprints start to shrink as a result of that on the channel approach. But I think that you know, even the, the pure, the, sorry, the, the, uh, the, the, um, uh, e-commerce only, the e-tailer groups, 
who exist only in cyberspace, they too struggle to, to, um, to sustain themselves in a very, very expensive space to occupy. And that's why you see a number of them experimenting with bricks and mortar in that omni-channel. Um, if, if you've ever shopped on Instagram, uh, bought a shirt from a brand you've never heard of, but you wanted to try it out because it looked good, you know, after you do that, you get, you get uh, barraged with, with uh, requests from brands that you've never heard of. It's a very, very competitive space. Um, you know, restaurants, we, we've seen a decline in apparel purchases over the last 10 years, and food and beverage has exploded. Now, some of it, I think, has been a little bit excessive, but it's, it is the true experience, right? You cannot experience the same thing at home if you're, if you're sitting down and, and, and being served at a table. So I think that in the long term, uh, once, once this is behind us, I think things will start to get back to normal. We have overexpanded uh, in the food and beverage category, so I think you'll start to see you know, a right sizing of some spaces, some, some smaller restaurant spaces where, where operators are being more efficient. Um, for, for grocery, uh, it, it's, it's a difficult space for them to operate in, um, even though I think there's, there have been groups who have, print or who have decided to embrace it for the time being. Fast casual, that's a little bit different than sit down. It's less experiential. So I think that the, the idea of curbside, I think in the long term is less about health and, um, as about uh, convenience. So whether it's a pickup or if they can figure out the model and delivery, would I rather have, I'll use an example, Chick-fil-A at home in my backyard or go to, you know, drive 20 minutes to your Chick-fil-A to pick it up? There's an argument to be made for, you know, some sort of, of shift in that. So I think you might see a, a decrease in those types of deals and perhaps a shrinking of those spaces. We're also seeing this explosion of um, ghost kitchens, which are, you know, the spaces that are strictly for, for food to be made. And in some cases, it's small merchants who are occupying the space because they don't want to pay the rents and bricks and mortar. But the national chains are doing it as well. McDonald's is occupying ghost kitchens where they don't see a need for to pay rent on, on expensive um, uh, rentable space. And rather, they're just shooting out their product to people who want it delivered. I think the biggest change is going to be, and the longer this thing drags out, the worse it's going to be, is the amount of excess space that we have a result, as a result of closures. And a, and a you know, quite possibly a drastically reduced number of retail prospects, depending on how long this drags out and the number of, of, uh, of, of groups that just can't make it. So I hope that some of the lasting effects in the long term that we do have control over are municipalities and developers being more reasonable about w what demand actually exists for retail. Um, I think it's a smart, safe thing to do, and I think we need to sort of do a, um, a bit of a, a check on ourselves to lean on other uses to create place than, than just shopping and, and uh, eating at restaurants. Um, I guess in the interest of time, I, you know, asked Ricardo to uh, answer the question, the last word. We're coming up on like a minute or two before we have to end. Um, so, you know, give Ricardo a, a, a chance to answer this question. And I think we'll, uh, unfortunately, this is all the time we have and uh, proceed to, to wrap up. Hey, thanks. I think I'll just, you know, those are all great points. I'm only going to add a couple of uh, brief things. And I think the, the main thing I would leave as a takeaway for everyone on physical retail space is that online retail is good at a couple of things. It's good at researching your purchase. And it's good at making a quick buy when you already know what it is that you want. But the one thing that online retail is still not, not all that great at is discovery and what I would call a true definition of shopping versus buying. Uh, and when we go to stores, right, there's an inherent shopping experience where my, the purpose of my initial visit may have been to buy one thing, but be, especially if I do this at a mall, I'm going to see a lot of other places that may entice me to say, oh, maybe I'll look for something there. And that's really the, the whole shopping experience versus the buy experience. And online is not good at shopping. It's good at buying. Uh, physical retail is much better at shopping, in fact, because the, when you think about where are the most friction points in physical retail, it tends to be in the buying part of, of that phase, you know, especially around payment and, and things. So where technology comes in is to make things easier. Uh, and I think the things that will stick around uh, of anything that has changed through this crisis are the things that make that shopping and buying experience both more convenient for the consumer. Uh, some of those things are going to come at a higher cost for the retailer and Retailers are going to have to look at what they can do to make them more efficient. Sometimes that may mean implementing a new technology. Sometimes it may mean changing an operational procedure. And many times it's going to be both. Uh, but the consumers will 
expect that because you know, we, we've said a lot of things about muscle memory, but I think the one thing that's the easiest muscle memory for consumers to retain is anything that makes it easy uh, to do that. So things like curbside pickup, I, I have to believe that that's an easy one, right? Consumers have liked that because it's easy for them. Uh, and if you even fast forward to a point where people have returned to work in their offices, uh, now that you can envision a much better combination of things where people will make a purchase while they're at the office online and pick it up curbside on their way home, right? That really adds to the convenience factor. It makes it easier to buy. And at the end of the day, if there's one thing that's made Amazon successful, it's because they've really mastered that convenience aspect in the purchasing process. Uh, so I think that's what's gonna dictate things that, that uh, stick around longer. Uh, it's these convenience elements that really affect both shopping and buying. So the customer is the king at the end of the day, right? And at the end of the day, well, I think it's, it's what for the, the not just that the customer is king, but convenience is king. We used to always say product is king sometimes, and sometimes the message is, is king. Good point. Uh, but no, it's really convenience. And I think the, the pandemic is going to reinforce that convenience, the, what constitutes convenience may be a little different than what we thought six months ago going forward, but that's still going to be the, the main thing consumers are going to look for. Great. Well, um, you know, thank you very much for spending a, a, an hour with us today. Thank you, Ricardo, Paul, uh, Mike, and, uh, and Marcus. Uh, on behalf of uh, myself and Gautam and George Mason University, uh, thank you for sharing your expertise. Uh, I'm sure the audience, unfortunately, we didn't get to some of the questions, but I'm sure the audience uh, is very appreciative of, of, of your insights this afternoon. And I'm sure this is just the start of a, of a long conversation going forward. And I'm sure we'll have a lot of more opportunity with Gautam and, and myself to discuss this uh, further. So, um, you know, thank you very much all for joining us. Uh, thank you very much for all the people who joined the, uh, the webinar this afternoon. And uh, we look forward to, oh, uh, we will be sending out an email with a link to the recording of this event if you want to listen to it or forward it to other people within your organizations. Um, so feel, uh, we'll watch out for that probably in the next day or two. So again, thank you for everybody. Um, Gotham, any last words? No, uh, I just want to echo the sentiment of Eric. Like, thank you for taking your time. Um, this has been great. I learned a lot. If you see me looking down, I was taking notes. Uh, and I think I, I, I'll end with what, what, what Paul said, right? Like we have more questions than answers at this point. And we might have to reconvene in a few months even to see it. Like, I think Michael said, hey, I'm, uh, he's afraid of wave two. What happens if wave two happens in November, uh, right? And so there are a lot of uncertainties and we'll, time will tell how this plays out. So hopefully we'll get you all back at another point to discuss where we, where we are. Uh, and again, thank you for the time. Thank you for the audience for joining us as well. Um, and that's, that's all I have to say. All right. Thank you very much. And Thanks we look forward to seeing you at a future George Mason event. Thank you, everybody.